Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our latest and greatest in our clinical uh, series here at Bridge. This is MAT, Medication for Addiction Treatment for Hospitalists. This is going to be geared toward inpatient healthcare settings, one of the most frequent areas of questions that we get. So we are so excited to dive into this topic today. I am Alicia Gonzalez. I'm the Clinical Training Director for the California Bridge Program. But way more importantly, way more excited, I cannot wait to hear what we have coming to us from one of our very favorite people, one of the original principal investigator founders of California Bridge, back to make a cameo appearance, Dr. Hannah Snyder. Hannah, can you introduce yourself to everybody? Hey, everybody. I'm Hannah. Um, I was one of the co-founders of Bridge, and I'm an addiction medicine doc at San Francisco General. Um, I run our Bridge Clinic, and relevant to this, I do a ton of inpatient addiction medicine consultations. So I'm super happy to talk to you about how we can best take care of our patients inside the hospital. Yeah. Hannah is one of my favorite people to text when I have questions about this stuff. So I can't wait for her to share her knowledge with all of you. If you're familiar with us or if you're not, the California Bridge Program is funded through a state grant here in California. We are a nonprofit organization that falls underneath the Public Health Institute. And we do not have any financial disclosures. Both uh, Hannah and I may end up saying names like bup buprenorphine. Instead of that, we might say Suboxone or we might say, you know, um, like Vivitrol instead of Naltrexone, but we're not trying to be uh, loyal to any brand names. We often will say the brand names that our patients use. So if we do slip up and we don't use generic names, please know that it's unintentional. And again, if you're not familiar with us here at California Bridge, we have this one goal. And this one goal that we have is to make evidence-based treatment for addiction available and easily accessible at every hospital in California by 2025. And I'm proud to say that we are at, I think over 280 of the 300 and change hospitals. We are so close to meeting this goal. And so we are really excited to have all of you here to join us to uh, help hopefully increase that. And in case you're somebody in the camp, especially on the inpatient side of like, why do we have to talk about treatment in the acute care setting? Why is that an us problem? You know, our problem was that we were using too many opioids and we have cut back on those prescriptions. This is a really telling graph here, which shows that over the past years, as we have done a great job, purple bar, shrinking, 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 we've done a great job of putting less unnecessary opioid prescription into the community, that did not step, stop, excuse me, opioid death rates from increasing. So that blue bar is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And why is that? That is because back in the day, like 15, 20 years ago, prescription opioids were a huge contributor of opioid death, but they're not anymore. Now we're talking about illicit drugs, namely fentanyl, which is pervasive in all of our communities. It is a, an indiscriminatory drug. It affects all colors, all people, all genders, all income brackets, all communities. And so we have to do something bigger than that. We have to change our thinking, realizing that addiction is a chronic and treatable medical disease, that it's going to be something that we look at the same way we look at any other consequence of unfortunate health choices. You know, if you make the choice to not be active and to eat poorly, you might get high blood pressure or diabetes. And we don't say, darn it, those were horrible choices you made. Cut off the donuts and good luck to you. Absolutely not. We say things like, hey, we need to give you insulin or we need to give you this blood pressure medicine to help to control these risk factors that exist in your life. These things that contribute to a higher risk of mortality for you. The same is true of addiction. People make certain choices to cope or to get through their life and some of them will end up addicted to drugs. And so we are not going to say to them, you are a bad person who made bad choices. No, we are going to say you have a chronic treatable medical disease and we have ways to help mitigate the risks of that disease to help you live the happiest and healthiest life that you can because that's our goal for everyone. And hence comes in the California Bridge model, this idea that we have to decrease the barriers of access to treatment. If drugs are easier to access than treatment, no one's going to be in treatment. So we've got to make that really easy. And that means including all of us in the acute care spectrum, whether it's the emergency department, hospitalist, labor and delivery, surgery, all of us that are seeing patients on the acute care side, because sometimes that's the only access patients have to care. Next, though, we are not asking you to become an addiction specialist. We are not asking you to manage this person's medication for the rest of their life. Our goal is to connect them from us starting, from resuscitating and stabilizing that person, starting that treatment, connecting them to ongoing care in our community, and then focusing on a culture of harm reduction, which to us is two things. Number one, addressing that stigma that we have held for a long time against patients who use drugs and thinking about the way that we talk to those patients or think about those patients, really reshaping it to be a chronic health 
issue that we can help with. But secondly, learning how to teach patients to truly decrease their morbidity and mortality from drugs. Things like not getting HIV, Hep C, dying from an overdose. How can we talk to patients openly about that? But this is a clinically driven lecture. So we are gonna spend the vast majority of our time here talking about prioritizing treatment. Why do we need treatment at all? Because patients who use opioids for a period of time, a long period of time, their body physiology, their chemistry physically changes. So for them to even feel normal, there needs to be some opioid in their system. To me, I think about this like insulin. People who have really advanced diabetes, their body needs exogenous medication, prescription insulin to function normally, right? No one's like being on insulin to abuse insulin. That's not how it works. They're using insulin because it's how their body needs to function. Same thing becomes true with opioids. If you are physically dependent on opioids and you don't have any in your system, you enter withdrawal, which is extremely painful. And even after you've gone through that first phases of withdrawal, your body will not stop having severe cravings, right? They want to smash that dopamine receptor. And so since that's the reality, we have medication that helps people pull from that withdrawal, horrible craving space into just feeling normal. Our goal is not to get them high or feel that euphoria you get from doing drugs, but to make people feel normal, to help balance out their body chemistry. There are a lot of medications we can use. We are not here to knock or support in any in specific, but we are going to talk a lot more about methadone and buprenorphine than we are about naltrexone in this particular setting. Uh, the evidence for methadone and for buprenorphine is really, really strong in patients who have opioid use disorder, less so with naltrexone. So we're going to really focus on those two. Um, but these are the ones that you can use. If you're, you know, hopefully everybody here is familiar with methadone, the full agonist, I think we all know a lot about that drug, but in case buprenorphine is a little bit newer for you, buprenorphine is a partial opioid receptor agonist. There are things about buprenorphine that we really love, especially for those of us in the emergency department. And there will be times for you in the acute care setting, in the hospitalist setting, where this is a great medicine for you to use too. As a partial agonist, it actually has a ceiling on respiratory depression. So since bup all by itself is not going to turn that receptor all the way on, you can't really overdose on bup alone. Yes, you could mix bup with alcohol and benzodiazepine and a bunch of other stuff and like you could overdose. I'm not saying it's not possible, but this medication by itself has a ceiling on respiratory depression, but it does not have a ceiling necessarily on therapeutic effects to treat withdrawal and pain and cravings. So you can go super, super high on your buprenorphine dosing without causing overdose from that medication. So we love it for that safety profile. It also has a really long half-life, 24 to 36 hours. So once patients are stabilized on it, they can take it like once a day, which is super convenient for them. And they don't have to go to an opioid treatment facility. They can have a prescription and have it at home. So for practical purposes, it's much easier for our patients. So we love that. And then it also has a super high affinity for that new receptor, higher than methadone, higher than naloxone, higher than fentanyl, higher than like anything else that likes to touch that new receptor, which means if you have buprenorphine in your system and you were to say, go use illicit drugs, let's say that you start your patient on bup, they go home, they find fentanyl in their sock drawer, they decide to take it, the bup is not going to let go. Those receptors that are currently occupied with buprenorphine are not going to get unseated. So it provides like a level of airway protection in a way. It helps patients to not overdose from drugs, even if they are going to relapse. Remember that relapsing is a part of every single medical condition, right? People with diabetes eat foods that have high sugar content. People with high blood pressure eat salty chips. Like we all do things that are not perfect for our health. So it's very normal to expect our patients to not be perfectly compliant with medicine on paper. So we like bup because it helps to protect people. Um, okay, that's the basics of bup. But why do we really care about getting patients onto bup or onto methadone? That is because it has an insane mortality benefit. We know people who are using opioids compared to the general population have a six times risk of death. But if you can get that person onto medications for addiction treatment, specifically methadone or bup, you're decreasing their mortality risk back down to close to that of the general population. There are very few medicines that give us this intense decrease in mortality, very few. Here's another way of looking at that. People who are on buprenorphine or are taking methadone who are in treatment, look at this bar, this insane decrease in their mortality risk, as opposed to somebody who is currently out of treatment um, in the community and using illicit opioids. So really, really good evidence. Another way of looking at that, number needed to treat. We love the items on this slide. We would consider them standard of care. We would never look at VFib arrest and not shock somebody. We would never see a person with a STEMI and not give aspirin. And yet, to save a life, 
to decrease mortality for somebody who uses opioids, you only have to start two people in treatment, two. This is the biggest bang for our buck in medicine. And we know that a lot of people are, oopsie, sorry about that, are you know using illicit drugs and are at very high risk of death. And so we definitely don't want to uh, to, to deny them treatment or to, to forget to focus on that. The good news here is that medication for addiction treatment works. We know that it works. We know that it is safe. And we really want to make sure that all of our patients have access to care. Um, as I fix my slides here, I'm actually going to hand it over to, to Hannah because we at Bridge, we talk a lot about why this is so important in the emergency department setting. Hannah, why is this important for a hospitalist, for a hospital, somebody on the inpatient service? First of all, that was an amazing pep talk. I feel super pumped and I feel really ready to treat people uh, with opioid use disorder. So, so the hospital is actually the perfect time to treat people for their opioid use disorder. This is a time where people are really motivated. There's been studies that have shown that two thirds of patients who are in the hospital who use drugs want to cut back or quit, right? You're there, you're resting, you have a time to think about the consequences of your actions. You might be hospitalized because of something having to do with their substance use disorder. And so people really want to make a change in this moment. And um, there's a few things that we can do to help them out, but the most important thing is starting on treatment. And so that's why we're really focused on this today. Um, the, the thing is that a lot of patients come into the hospital, they wanna make a change, and then they get hit with like stigma. They get hit with pressure, they get hit with judgment. And what we wanna do is we wanna decrease all that and make it really easy for them to access treatment with either methadone or buprenorphine um, so that they can make that change in their life. One. I don't have the slides quite yet. I can keep it. Um, <laughs> um, so there have been studies, just like in the emergency department setting, of initiating buprenorphine in the hospital and then linking people to ongoing treatment. And what those studies have shown is that if you just tell a person, hey, go follow up with buprenorphine after you're hospitalized, um, the probability of the person... Um, linking to treatment is really, really low. But if you actually start them on buprenorphine while they're inside the hospital, get them to a therapeutic dose and then discharge them, the rates of retention and treatment and linkage to care skyrocket. I believe it's a six-fold increase, um, which is really transformational and very similar to what we see in the emergency department population as well. So the question that people always get hit us with is, is this allowed? I thought methadone was something you could only get from opioid treatment program. I thought buprenorphine needed an X waiver. We're coming to that into a, in a minute, but in the emergency department and in the hospital, people can get treated with methadone or buprenorphine for as long as they're there. So if you're in the hospital for like six weeks for IV antibiotics for a severe infection, you can get methadone or buprenorphine regardless of certification of your hospital or provider for that entire period of time, which is awesome. That's going to make your patients stay inside the hospital. At discharge, anybody with an active DEA can prescribe buprenorphine for home treatment. Um, which is super exciting. The X waiver is gone. We're going to show you a slide on that. Um, it's a huge change, super transformational. For methadone, methadone is funky, right? Methadone is highly regulated. So any provider can prescribe methadone for pain, but we can't prescribe methadone for opioid use disorder. So if you're discharging a patient from the hospital, they need to either link directly to an opioid treatment program or they can come back to your emergency department to dose three days in a row for up to 72 hours. There is a new regulation that allows individual prescribers and practice groups to apply to the DEA to actually send somebody out the door with three days. In the hospital setting, this is going to be super transformational for us, right? There's a lot of patients who need to get discharged on a Friday. There's no reason to hold them, but they can't do methadone intake until on Monday. If you, if you apply to the DEA to do that dispensing, you can actually send them out the door with those three days of methadone. Absolute game changer. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to talk very, very briefly. We have a full lecture about how to start buprenorphine for patients who are in withdrawal. We are not going to dive super deep into that right now. Please feel free to, to reference our other lecture if you are not familiar with that. But just to put us all on the same page, here's the basics of how it works. This is the full guide that we have. Follow that QR code, read the whole thing. It's not complicated, which is the main take home. First things first, if your patient is in withdrawal, they need to actually be in withdrawal so that we're not going to precipitate withdrawal, meaning let's say that you have a full aggregate, a bunch of fentanyl in your system. I mentioned that bup is stronger, right? It would knock off that fentanyl and bring you down to middle, which is going to be called precipitating withdrawal. We want our patients to have already entered withdrawal so that buprenorphine is lifting them up and relieving pain and suffering, making them feel better. 
But if the patient wants to try bup, the key here not being they want to enter into treatment for the rest of their life, you just offer them, do you want to feel better now? Do you want to try this medication now? Then we give them at least 16 milligrams. Patients who use fentanyl regularly might need higher doses, but we advocate for 16 milligrams to start. It's oral, dissolvable, dissolves in their mouth, and then you reassess them. Next slide. Uh, at the time of reassessment, if they're getting better, awesome. Give them another dose. We want to fully load our patients to really help them feel better initially. If they're not getting any better, pause, take a step back, see if you're missing something um, because things like COVID, alcohol withdrawal, substance, DKA can all also look like opioid withdrawal, but keep giving the buprenorphine. And then when it's time for discharge, because your patient's feeling amazing and they're so happy that you did this for them, maybe you kept them on bup their whole hospitalization and that was better able to manage their withdrawal symptoms and their cravings. We, we, the doctor taking care of them in the hospital are going to write them a prescription. And that is a prescription long enough to get them to outpatient care. That's in most communities gonna be somewhere between two weeks and a month. Don't be afraid of writing a prescription that size. It's totally okay. It's very safe and it's, it's safer than the patient not going home with that prescription. The most common discharge prescriptions are gonna be somewhere between 62 and 32 milligrams daily. And that can be as a once or twice a day dose. It's kind of patient preference based, doesn't really matter. And it helps if you stick, if you're in California, if you stick the ICD-10 code um, in the discharge prescription, it just kind of helps signal to the pharmacy what you're using that medication to treat for because it gets billed through a carve out in the Medi-Cal system, um, which patients don't have to pay for it. So it's really important. And then of course we advocate taking home naloxone. Next slide, Hannah mentioned this, but there is no more x waiver. So when I say we, we the doctors, the ER doc, the hospitalist, the surgeon, the OBGYN, all of us can do this as of right now without needing an x waiver. It's a really important thing. And that's national. I don't care what state you're calling in from. There's no excuses. If you can write for hydrocodone or you can write for morphine, you can write for buprenorphine. All right, Hannah. Okay, so um, for hospitalists, we're going to talk a lot about starting medications just like Alicia did, but we're also going to talk about continuing medications. So like first and foremost, if a person is on outpatient buprenorphine or the ED starts the buprenorphine, we inside the hospital should be continuing that buprenorphine. Alicia was talking about hospital discharge dosing anywhere from 16 milligrams to 32 milligrams. That's going to be our range inside the hospital as well. Um, I'd say in the era of fentanyl, we're talking a lot more 24, 32 milligrams. If somebody's using like heroin or lower dose of oral opioids, they might be more of a 16 milligram kind of person. But we always, always, always want to continue it in the hospital. Even if the person is in pain, even if they're having surgery, no matter what, just continue their buprenorphine dose in the hospital. If the person's dose is insufficient, say the ED gave them 16 milligrams and they're really still feeling it, they're still having cravings, um, then we're going to go up on their dose inside the hospital, titrating up to control the cravings and withdrawal. Again, usually in that range of 16 to 32. You can dose daily. You can dose TID. You can do a long-acting injectable dose. Any of those are fine. The TID dosing is nice if somebody's also having pain or if you're kind of trying to figure out the right dose for them because the analgesic effect of buprenorphine is about six hours. So doing more frequent dosing if somebody's in a lot of pain is really nice. Big reminder and really important for us to train all of our like nursing colleagues on is that buprenorphine is sublingual and in some cases rarely buccal. And so it's really important to let them dissolve it under the tongue and not swallow the meds because it will not do a dang thing except for make their stomach upset if they swallow their medications. So Alicia went through our main emergency department pathway of like, what do you do if a person is in withdrawal? And if a person is in florid withdrawal in front of you in the hospital with objective signs of withdrawal, that's what I would do as well. But if a person is admitted to the hospital and they are not yet in withdrawal, then we're going to talk about microdosing, cross tapering, low dose initiation. There's like a bunch of different terms for this. There is a or there is going to be in the next couple days, hot off the presses, a California bridge guideline to microdosing. And this is an update of what we had before. But the core principle here that you can see is that a person should stay on a full opioid agonist like morphine, like Dilaudid, like Oxy, like methadone, you name it to treat their withdrawal. And then over the course of about three days, we're gonna give them these teeny tiny doses of buprenorphine and slowly up titrate them until they get to a therapeutic dose. So I'm gonna break down a couple different ways that this can happen. I think this is really helpful in the hospital and we'll talk about a couple key times to do this, but in the hospital, your first branch point is always gonna be like, do they want buprenorphine or methadone? And then if they want bup in the hospital, I'm gonna say, is this a microdose situation or a macrodose situation? Any of those options, totally cool. We can go through any of them. 
So if somebody is in withdrawal with objective signs, go ahead and do the macro dose with a 16 milligram start like we talked about. If somebody is not yet in withdrawal or they have horrible pain or they're about to go to surgery, then let's talk about this microdosing situation. So this is a kind of goofy graphic uh, from a, a paper that we really like that shows that essentially with microdosing, what you're trying to do is you're not waiting for the person to go into withdrawal. You're just giving them baby, baby doses of buprenorphine. And I'm thinking about it like I'm sneaking buprenorphine onto their receptors, like the person's not even noticing it's happening um, until you slowly build up to a therapeutic dose. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. I do tell my patients, it's not that you're gonna feel no withdrawal. It's just not that you're gonna to have to wait for florid withdrawal and you're not gonna precipitate withdrawal. Instead, you might just feel uh, subacutely bad, right? Over the course of these few days. And many patients have a strong preference for this microdosing versus macrodosing or vice versa. So that's the most important decision point, right? Is patient preference. If somebody comes in and they're like, I have had precipitate withdrawal a bunch of times before and I do not want to macrodose, fine. Let's do a microdose for that person. Um, some patients get confused with microdosing. It's kind of a complicated process. And so if you have a patient with lower health literacy or less experience with buprenorphine, you might want to steer clear of microdosing. Um, if somebody is super anxious in a ton of pain or really medically acute, I might lead towards microdosing because it's a more gentle process. If somebody needs surgery or heaven forbid, multiple surgeries, right? Like you have a burn patient, you have a trauma patient. That might be somebody where microdosing is gonna make sense. They're gonna be in the hospital for a while. They need full opioid agonists anyway, go for it. And then another important branch point is how long do I think this person's gonna be in the hospital? Because if they're hospitalized for like a COPD exacerbation and I'm anticipating they're getting discharged tomorrow, I'm not gonna go down the microdosing road because we're probably not gonna get through the process. Um, but if the person's gonna be with us for at least three days, then this might be a good option for that person. Okay, so here's the big picture. Here's one example of how to do a microdosing start. We're going to do, um, this is one example over a three-day period. And what you do is you pick the opioid, the full opioid agonist that is right for that patient. So whatever is kind of standard in your hospital, go for it. If it's morphine, if it's oxy, if it's dilaudid, whatever people are comfortable with. And then you take a relatively low starting dose, right? So like in my practice, I'll often use like oxy 10 or 15, and then I'll see how that goes for them. And I'll slow, quickly ramp it up. So if that didn't do it for them, I'll go to 20. And if that didn't do it for them, I'm going to go to 40 until I'm adequately treating their withdrawal with their full opioid agonist. And then once I'm adequately treating their withdrawal, I'm starting this low dose buprenorphine initiation. So one example of that is taking a quarter of one of the two milligram tablets, so that's 0.5 milligrams, and doing it Q3 hours for the first day. And then I go to one milligram Q3 hours the subsequent day. And then the next day, day three, I can actually give that first eight milligram sublingual buprenorphine dose, which is starting to get towards a therapeutic dose. This whole time I'm continuing those full opioid agonists and I'm not dropping it until the person is on a therapeutic dose, right? Um, so usually day three, we get up to eight milligrams sublingual TID, and then day four, we can go to like a standing daily dose. Um, another option is to do that first sublingual dose um, and then switch over to an injectable. So something like the Sublocade product, the 300 milligram dose and transition from there. But this is just one example. There are a million different ways to do this. Hospital pharmacies have preferences for formularies. Different patients are in different situations. A microdosing start might be a really good option for somebody who's actually already on a high dose of methadone and wants to switch over to buprenorphine for any reason. In those cases, if somebody's on over 100 milligrams of methadone, they're usually going to need a slower process than that three-day one I just outlined. So maybe go to more towards something like this eight-day protocol that we have lined up here. I'm not going to go through all these details, but just go through the options and figure out which one's right for your patient. Um, we also have a troubleshooting guide here. Um, the most important thing, the most commonly common time I see people um, get like mixed up is if a patient is skipping a lot of the sublingual buprenorphine doses, they can feel crappy. Or if the full opioid agonists are not enough, they can feel pretty crappy. And so those might be times where we want to titrate the way that their medications are going. We might want to space out the buprenorphine start and make it a little more gentle. If somebody were to actually go into precipitate withdrawal, then you just switch to the other pathway and you do it like a macrodose start. And that's fine. That happens sometimes. I'll also flag because these are like slower processes and can be a little challenging, this might be a good time to use those old school adjuvant medications like clonidine, like undansetron, like loperamide, anything like that, or even like um, a multimodal analgesia, including ketamine, something like that to get the patient through this process.
you can reference this as well. Again, just use whatever opioid you are comfortable with, your hospital is comfortable with, and your patient is comfortable with. Some hospitals, for example, mine, say you're not allowed to quarter buprenorphine. This is super like pharmacy by pharmacy. And so in our hospital, we do this with IV buprenorphine. You can do this with transdermal patches. It's all the same concept of just like slow and steady increases in the buprenorphine dose. And we'll send that guideline out at the end of the presentation. Okay, so those are our buprenorphine options, right? A patient wants to do buprenorphine. Your branch point is micro versus macro. The other option, which is still a fantastic option for a lot of our patients, is methadone. Um, methadone and buprenorphine are both evidence-based life-saving treatments, right? Like Alicia really hammered this home. Um, and it's just a patient-centered decision. It's just what people want to do. So here's some of how I counsel my patients through it. Um, for buprenorphine, in most cases, you have to wait for withdrawal. Some patients are happy to do that. Some patients would really rather not. Um, there is some risk of precipitated withdrawal with buprenorphine start. Some people are cool with that. Some people aren't, right? Bup, the nice thing about bup is if you're going to do a macro dose start, that person is therapeutic on their dose within like a couple hours. Um, and that's very different than methadone, like we'll talk about. And buprenorphine has this ceiling effect on respiratory depression. So it's a lot safer in the early titration with lower risk of accidental overdose. Methadone does not have a risk of precipitated withdrawal, right? It's a full opioid agonist. It's not going to happen. Um, for people who are really squeamish, squeamish about withdrawal, this is a simpler initiation for them. And there are data that show us that there's increased retention and treatment for methadone versus buprenorphine. And that's probably highly confounded by uh, the patients just being different and the programs being more structured. Um, some patients feel like higher doses of methadone give them better symptom control than buprenorphine, but that really hasn't been studied and it's just a patient-driven uh, decision. I will say that methadone, I love it a lot. I use it a lot, but it does have an increased risk of sedation and respiratory depression. And all my ED docs on this call know that and have seen that, right? And so that's something that we have to think about pros and cons. If somebody's also using say benzos or has had a lot of overdoses or is gonna to continue to use in some way, methadone might be a little bit more challenging for that person. So here's an example of our methadone quick start guide. Again, you can scan the QR code. We'll, uh, we'll be putting links in the chat here. Um, super straightforward. We tried to combine the emergency department and hospital uh, medicine and stuff into one guide. So in the ED, most of the time, if somebody wants, wants methadone and doesn't have like major medical issues, right? Like I'm talking like they're not decompensated from their heart failure and like uh, with hypoxia, right? Like that would be a person I might not want to start methadone. Um, but if a person is fairly fairly medically stable, you just go ahead and give methadone 30 milligrams in the emergency department and then refer them to methadone for follow-up in most cases. But for our hospitalized patients, it's going to go on from there, right? We're not going to leave that person at 30 milligrams because nobody feels therapeutic at 30 milligrams. I have never met a patient where that was the right dose. Um, so in the hospital, day two, you're going to give them 40 milligrams and day three, you're going to give them 50 milligrams. And actually, each of those days, you can give an additional 10 milligrams um, after four hours if the patient isn't sedated because the peak effect of methadone is at four hours. So you're going to dose that person with say they're 40 milligrams, go eyeball them four hours later. And if they're still feeling cruddy, which they probably are, and they're not super sedated, then you just go ahead and give them an additional 10. So you can drive up the dosing a little bit faster in those cases. After those first three days, because methadone has a really, really long half-life, we have to slow down our titration. Um, and we increase by 10 milligrams about every three to five days. Again, continue increasing throughout the entire hospitalization until the patient feels good without cravings or withdrawal. This is another situation like the microdosis starts where it's totally okay to add full opioid agnus on top, and it's totally okay to add clonidine and our other adjunctive medications. Um, go slower on this titration if people have any respiratory depression or any sedation, right? We want to hold doses if that ever comes up, but we want to keep cranking the dose until the patient has the resolution of their cravings or withdrawal. And I get consulted on a lot of hospital cases where somebody has been on 40 milligrams for two weeks and they've been miserable and they want to leave the hospital. And that's on us because we should continue their titration. The vast majority of patients are needing at least 100 milligrams and my people who have fentanyl use with really high dosing are routinely requiring over 200 milligrams. That's like not unusual. And so know that we need to just keep slowly increasing that dose and doing it in a safe way. 
With fentanyl use and with pregnancy, the doses that you are going to need are going to be higher. And again, we're just dosing until resolution of cravings or withdrawal um, and lack of sedation. So I get a lot of questions about like, what is the right therapeutic dose for my patient? I can't tell you that. You've got to dose to whatever the patient needs. And we should not be having like institutional ceilings on our methadone dose because of that. Um, so I just gave you the traditional way to start methadone, but much like buprenorphine, um, in the era of fentanyl, we're having to kind of crank our doses. Um, and SAMHSA actually just put out new national guidance for all the opioid treatment programs that we can dose people even faster. They have not yet trickled down to California, so you're not going to see your methadone clinics doing this yet. But in our hospital, um, we have a pilot going, and I, I'm seeing this at many other hospitals as well, where we can dose people faster. If they have objective evidence of fentanyl, so with eutoxes in non-pregnant patients, in pregnant patients, I just trust the patient, right? Because eutoxes need to be done with caution in pregnancy. Um, in those cases, we're going to titrate faster. So my first dose will be 40 milligrams, and then four hours later, I'll give them another 20 for 60. The next day, I'll start with a 60 milligram dose, and then four hours later, I'll give them another 20, right? And I'm still checking them at four hours to make sure they're not having any sedation. And I'm not doing this if somebody is high risk for sedation with older age or significant pulmonary, renal, uh, hepatic, or cardiac disease. Um, I'm monitoring them really sedate, closely for sedation, and I'm cranking the dose as much as I can in a safe way so that we can keep these patients inside the hospital and avoid an AMA discharge. This is also going to make people way more likely to link to methadone if when they're discharged, they're on a therapeutic dose. Okay, so um, for our hospitalists, for our inpatient nurses, it's also super important to know what to do if somebody shows up in the hospital who's been on methadone, right? Like this is actually the majority of our cases. I know it's hard to communicate with OTP sometimes with methadone clinics, but do our best to reach out to your OTP colleagues and figure out what's going on with their dosing. We can't be dosing. If, if a person comes in off the street and tells me they're on 200 milligrams of methadone, I am not just going to believe them and start that dose because that is really risky if it's not true. I could definitely oversedate somebody. So my first step is going to be to call their opioid treatment program and say like, hey, what is their dose and when did they last dose? We put a schedule down here for um, for titration. So if a person has missed a couple days of methadone and you confirm the dose, you can use this guide to figure out what dose to start in the hospital and then how to increase it over time. If you can't reach that OTP, say it's like a Sunday and they're not answering their phones, you got to treat it as a new start. And then on Monday, you can confirm the dose and you can go from there. And we know that's rough for our patients. We're going to use full short acting, full opioid agnus and clonidine and other things like that to get them through that tough day. And then we're going to talk to the OTP as soon as we possibly can. Um, methadone has a couple of funky things this OTP, and when I say OTP, that's like a methadone clinic or an opioid treatment clinic. Um, so cures and PDMPs are not going to show methadone dosing in an OTP. And so I often hear like, hey, this patient is not telling the truth. It's not in their cures report. They probably actually are telling the truth. It just doesn't get pulled in. And some hospitals, urine toxicology actually doesn't show methadone. So you got to talk to your lab and figure out what is going to show up on your urine toxicology screens. Um, at discharge for methadone, just to reemphasize this, because I don't want anyone to get into trouble, we are not going to do regular methadone prescribing because it is not allowed. It is illegal. However, we're going to link that person as quickly as possible to an opioid treatment program. And that means for all my substance use navigators on the call, you know this well, we've got to start working on methadone discharge plans before the day of discharge if it's a new start, because most OTPs are going to either have a little wait time or not do any intakes on the weekends. So we have to think about what day they're going to get discharged and kind of get them on that wait list as soon as we can. You can have the patient come in for three days and dose in the emergency department after discharge if your ED is down to do that. And like we talked about, we can um, kind of sidebar on this if anyone is ready to take this step, but there is now a DEA regulation that's going to allow an individual provider to actually write to the DEA and say, I want to give a three-day supply. It's really exciting, and I can work with any hospitalist group on doing that. Okay, what if my patient is pregnant? People always panic about this. That is okay, and we are going to do exactly the same thing, and it is even more important in a pregnant patient than in a non-pregnant patient. Um, uh, we know that pregnant people, like in my medical school training, for example, I spend so much time learning about postpartum hemorrhages and preeclampsia and sepsis in pregnancy and all this stuff. Overdose is a way more common cause of prenatal and uh, postpartum mortality than any of that stuff. And so we really, really need to focus in on treating those patients. 
Medications for addiction treatment, both bup and methadone, are safe in pregnancy, are safe in breastfeeding, and are strongly recommended by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So it's all fine. It's all safe. And actually being on any of those medications, yes, it does put you at risk for neonatal abstinence syndrome for your baby having withdrawal. But actually we know that people who don't engage in methadone or buprenorphine treatment have higher rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And that's because it's so hard to abstain from use during pregnancy if you're not on one of these medications. So very strong recommendation for either one of these medications. And we do our initiations essentially exactly the same way as our non-pregnant patients keeping in mind that they may need a higher dose um, and keeping in mind that in some cases it's pretty psychosocially complicated. So these patients do not require hospital admission or fetal monitoring for initiation, but many hospitals, including my own, do offer that in some cases to really back up our pregnant people um, and help them kind of safely and stably get on these medications so they can link to follow-up care because we know it's so very important. Both methadone and buprenorphine require increased dosing, particularly in the third trimester, because your volume of distribution when you're pregnant gets huge and your hepatic metabolism really speeds up. So we're talking in most cases, higher doses and three times a day dosing. And many opioid treatment programs will work with you to allow the patient to do three times a day dosing. We do have separate materials on uh, buprenorphine and methadone in pregnancy as well. The other kind of edge case that we talk a lot about is in the setting of acute pain, what do I do? Like I'm admitting this person to the hospital and like I was saying, um, they were a trauma center or were a burn center and we know they're gonna need surgery after surgery over the next couple of weeks. If they came in and they're already on their methadone or bup, you continue those medications, absolutely. And then you know that that medication is not gonna be enough to treat their pain, right? That medication is treating their withdrawal, treating their cravings and keeping them inside the hospital. Um, and we're going to continue them on their medications. And then we're going to add on multimodal analgesics like NSAIDs, Tylenol, gabapentin, benzos. We know, we know what to do here, right? We're going to use our full arsenal of medications. And then it's okay to use full opioid agonists on top, just like we would for any other patients. If they're going to have a serious surgery, they might need full opioid agonists um, and they might require higher doses than our other patients. And that's okay. That's not them being drug seeking. We know that they're going to have an increased tolerance. So for methadone and buprenorphine, it is essentially the same. It's keep them on their home medications and give all the different pain medications that we would otherwise. And um, for buprenorphine and for methadone, these are chronic. Uh, we know that opioid use disorder is a chronic disease. And like Alicia was saying, it requires chronic treatment. And so the worst thing we can do, the biggest disservice, is to bring a person into the hospital and stop this life-saving medication for them. Um, I do get a lot of questions about, like, I'm squeamish about this person's methadone dose. Can I taper their methadone inside the hospital? And I will say, almost never is this a good idea. Um, if you're going to do it, I would do it in discussion with a person's opioid treatment program. And I would really only do it if we're worried about respiratory depression or sedation for a patient. If they have actual torsades, I might stop their methadone, but not just necessarily just for QTC prolongation in most cases. Or if a patient strongly prefers to stop their methadone, then I might transition them to buprenorphine or decrease their dose. Get a lot of questions about QTC. I think different hospitals policies are gonna vary, but what I'll say my practice here is, if somebody has a pretty prolonged QTC, like they're coming in and it's over 500, I'm just gonna like pull back on their methadone dose for a day, try to stop all the other QTC prolonging meds, fix their electrolytes, and then see if I can get their QTC back to normal so I can keep their methadone where it needs to be. Because again, pulling off that methadone dose is really dangerous in terms of risk of overdose. If either methadone or buprenorphine is discontinued, the all-cause mortality in those patients increases six-fold in the next four weeks. So we really don't want to do it unless it's absolutely a life-threatening situation. Um, I'm going to talk just for a couple minutes about non-opioid use disorder treatment in the hospital. And um, we are not going to talk about alcohol withdrawal. We are not going to talk about like management of methamphetamine related psychosis, but we are going to talk about the basics of what you can start safely on the hospitalist side at the time of discharge or a few days before if you want to do it. So we have a whole guide on alcohol use disorder treatment um, that you can scan this QR code and check it out. Um, there are a couple medications that we really think are helpful in the acute care setting. Um, one is naltrexone, and this is going to be your most common medication. 
Um, and the other one is going to be gabapentin, which we're going to sometimes do at discharge. So, um, so naltrexone is going to be your like workhorse for the hospitalist uh, setting. Um, naltrexone has been approved by the FDA. It has the best number needed to treat. It's going to be most helpful for most of your patients. Um, you can also use off-label gabapentin. Um, this is going to be more so if a person is also experiencing withdrawal or their drinking is really driven by anxiety. We put disulfiram and acamprosate on this slide because they are FDA approved. And I will say I very rarely use either one of those. Disulfiram is the old school antibuse that's going to make you throw up if you uh, drink alcohol. No better than placebo in large trials. And then acamprosate, it's three times a day dosing. Uh, it's hard for a lot of patients to use and the number needed to treat is a lot higher. So naltrexone, our workhorse, comes in a daily pill. You can do 50 milligrams PO daily, or you can do an injectable gluteal uh, 380 milligrams IM. Um, and that's monthly. And that's really nice. Either one of these is totally fine. So if your hospital is set up for IM naltrexone, by all means, let's do it. If you're not, it's totally okay to do oral. And I really lean on IM if I think the person is going to struggle to take a daily pill. Um, otherwise, they're roughly equivalent in the studies that we do have. Um, the nice thing about naltrexone is that it's going to help people cut back or quit. So you don't need to be fully abstinent on naltrexone. I tell my patients, hey, this is just going to like scale back that craving. And if you do slip up and have a drink, it's going to let you have like one or two drinks instead of one or two drinks leads to 10 drinks leads to 20 drinks lands you back in the ED, right? And so that can be really transformational for our patients who aren't ready to cut it off altogether. Um, the extended release in particular, we do think is promising for emergency department patients um, who may or may not uh, link quite so successfully to outpatient ongoing uh, daily medications. Um, but again, either one is just fine. I would avoid naltrexone if somebody has opioid use disorder. And you might be saying, Hannah, that's really weird because you told us at the beginning that naltrexone can be a treatment for opioid use disorder. The thing is that naltrexone is basically like long acting naloxone or Narcan. So if somebody has opioids in their system and they're physically dependent and I give them an injection of naltrexone, I'm going to put them in a really long and miserable withdrawal. So I, in almost every case, I'm gonna recommend against this for somebody who has an opioid use disorder. Um, and it, it's also gonna prevent them from using things like buprenorphine or methadone. We don't wanna do that. We know those meds save lives. The other situation in which we would avoid naltrexone is if somebody has really significant liver disease. So many of our folks with alcohol use disorder have a little liver disease. That's fine. But if your AST or ALT is greater than five times the upper limit of normal, or you have decompensated cirrhosis, child's Q class C plus or minus child's Q class B, that might be some time you want to steer clear of this. Um, many of those patients can actually start it in the outpatient setting once their liver has cooled off just a little bit. But as a hospitalist, at the time of discharge for alcohol withdrawal admissions, for example, or for pancreatitis admissions when they're off of the uh, off of the opioids, this can be really huge. We can write that prescription for naltrexone. We can give them a test dose in the hospital, make sure it's okay, and then send them out the door with it. I see these patients do way better and be much less likely to be admitted when we start them on these medications. It's a part of our more comprehensive package of like harm reduction counseling. How are you going to drink safely? Um, if you're going to keep drinking, how are you going to not drive and not end up in here as a trauma? Um, making sure that people are doing well from a nutrition perspective. If people are doing really poorly from a nutrition perspective and really not eating food, just having alcohol, that might be a time to use thiamine and folate. Otherwise, you might not need to do that for the majority of patients. Okay, last phase, talking about stimulant use disorder. And in particular, we're going to talk about meth, right? Because we are in California and this is what we see in the vast majority of cases. So this is not to talk about like what to do if somebody has meth-induced psychosis. That's a whole nother thing. But if a person wants to cut back on their meth use, we do have some medications that can make a difference for them. The way I think about this is like meth withdrawal is kind of like a, just a crippling depression in a lot of ways, right? Because meth gives you such high surges of dopamine that when you stop taking it, you feel horrible. You feel sad. You can't sleep. You, like nothing brings you joy, right? And so what we're going to use is we're going to use meds that are historically for depression in most cases to lift a person out of that and help them cut back on their use. These are not game changers like methadone or bup, but they do help people cut back on their use and help them cut back on their cravings. So first line in most situations, I'm going to use mirtazapine at 30 milligrams QHS, um, and that's going to work well for most of our patients. Bupropion can be a good second line option if a person, say, doesn't want that sedating effect from the mirtazapine or is worried about the weight gain. 
And that can be nice, particularly for people who use meth to kind of give them that like stimulant boost. Bupropion can kind of give you that stimulant boost. And that can be nice for a lot of folks. The only contraindication there is if they have seizures. And then the other thing is that you can pair bupropion together with naltrexone, um, and that increases the efficacy. And um, for my hospitalist colleagues out there, at the time I think about that is if somebody is having a lot of unintentional overdoses, or if somebody also uses like unintentional fentanyl contamination leading to overdose, or if they also have an alcohol use disorder, um, we can add the naltrexone and that can decrease those risks. Um, so this just shows you that there is a, a small but significant decrease in methamphetamine use when you start mirtazapine. Um, we can talk about one last thing, which is what if my patient uses drugs in the hospital? Um, if a person uses drugs in the hospital, that is really common. That is normal. We see that a lot. It stresses us out a lot. But studies have shown that 30 to 40 people percent of people who use injection drugs and have are there for associated infections are using inside the hospital. And so we want to be aware of this. We want to have plans in place and we want to support people. And it's often because people are miserable in the hospital. I am miserable in the hospital, right? Like they're bored, they're sad, they're lonely, they're in pain, they're away from their support systems, and they might turn to their substances. If this happens, I always just start with a conversation. What happened? How can I help you out? Is it because of withdrawal? In which case I'm going to give more buprenorphine or methadone. Is it because of pain? In which case I'm going to give them uh, better analgesic plans. Um, is it just, I'm really bored and I'm going crazy. All right, well, can I bring you like a coloring book or games or get you like a visitor or charge your phone so you can like call your friends? Um, if there's worries about the person having ongoing use, one thing that you can do is ask patients to just put their belongings in a locked cabinet so that they can't get to them, but that you keep them safe. And it's really important to emphasize it is not a best practice to involve the criminal justice system in a situation like this, right? Like we don't want, heaven forbid, our patients like being arrested on the unit because they slipped up and used. We want them to be able to treat, finish their treatment plan. All right. I'm going to stop my share. Yeah, and turn perfect. To I am just going to make a quick shout out that it's so incredible that, that all the things Hannah balances, including being the mother of a sick child, and yet she is still giving her time to us at Bridge. So <laughs> thank you. All right. So I want to just make a quick plug. You know, Hannah mentioned these things like patients using drugs in the hospital, like in the bathroom, right? Like that happens kind of a lot. And for those of you who do have a navigator in your hospital, I just want to put a huge plug in that they can be so helpful in facilitating those conversations that aren't always the easiest for our team or maybe not for your nurses, et cetera. So it's important to engage anybody you have um, who feels comfortable, you know, having those tougher conversations, but being empathetic. And a lot of times our navigators, at least in California, have lived experience or are more of a peer and can just level with somebody in a way that it doesn't always feel to them as welcoming to talk to somebody in a white coat or somebody in nursing scrubs, right? So um, please use your navigators. That's part of that connection to ongoing care that we talk about that we think is just so important. And finally, we want to spend a brief second just talking a bit about harm reduction. Um, it's just important that you know of a handful of tools that are out there for our patients. So one of them is fentanyl test strips. We had a lot of questions about this. Fentanyl test strips are designed to be able to help patients who are trying to use not fentanyl as their drug, let's say methamphetamine or cocaine, to figure out if there is clandestine fentanyl inside of the drugs they're about to use, which would, of course, increase their risk of an opioid overdose if they're not interested in Op using opioids right now. Um, these are not perfect. They're actually like technologically, they are kind of difficult to use. Their ability to detect fentanyl has gotten a lot better. A positive is a positive. It's really specific in that way, but they're not as sensitive. Like imagine we talk about the chocolate chip cookie. If the little cookie, the, the chocolate chips in the cookie are the fentanyl and you test the part of the cookie without the chocolate chips in it, you're not going to detect the fentanyl. So they're not perfect at saying that there's no fentanyl in something, but they are good at saying that there is. They're not the answer to everything that we wish they were, but it's just important to know that they exist and they are a really helpful tool for our patients. Way more importantly is going to be naloxone. This is the CPR or the AED of 2024. Like we want to put naloxone in the hands of all of our patients. And we do know that writing a prescription doesn't count. And I know a lot of us are relying on like, oh, it's over the counter now. Wrong. It costs a bunch of money. It's not free over the counter. It's like 30 to $50 for a box. So I would not expect your patients to go buy it. And then we know that the fill rate on your naloxone prescriptions nationally is somewhere between one and 2%. Not great. 
Instead, in a lot of states and in California in particular, um, it is allowed, you're allowed to hand out naloxone, just distribute it for patients to go home. And in California, we have, we have a program that's funded. At most of our hospitals we work with, you have an naloxone distribution program from your emergency department where somebody like your navigator could literally bring naloxone to the bedside and send it home with your patient. So if you don't know about that, if you're a hospitalist, reach out to your ER colleagues and find out. They might have a stash of naloxone that's allowed to be just brought to the bedside. So use your resources that already exist. We like to tell our patients about not using alone. So in an ideal world, yes, nobody would do bad drugs and nobody would die from drug overdose. I totally understand that. But people are going to do that, just like they're going to not exercise and they're going to, you know, eat foods that are bad for them. Like we are all humans. We love targeting our dopamine center. It's how we evolved. So a really important thing is that if a patient dies, they'll never be able to enter treatment. Only patients who are alive can enter treatment. And so if we ever want to be able to get people into treatment, we have to keep them alive. That's what naloxone is for. And that's what this hotline is for. Never use alone. Patients who don't have somebody around them when they're going to use drugs can call this hotline. It's anonymous. They give them their location and their first name. They tell them you know, how they're going to use their drugs. And someone just stays on the line with you to make sure that you don't overdose. And if you do, they send emergency personnel to where you are. So really powerful tool. I have my patients actually save this as a favorite in their phone right in front of me. So I know that they have it. And I want to take a beat to acknowledge that talking about drug use is not always a comfortable thing for everybody who works in healthcare. And I don't necessarily think that it's going to be, um, but it does get easier with practice. And the idea here is radical acceptance. It's helping our patients again, stay alive and live well as best they can, avoiding things like hepatitis and HIV and endocarditis and cellulitis and abscesses and all the things, death um, that can come from drug use that we don't want them to experience. And so getting a little bit better about talking to our patients about accessing, you know, um, sterile supplies as opposed to reusing supplies, not sharing supplies. And then also there's an amazing website at the National Harm Reduction Coalition that if you don't feel as comfortable, um, they have videos there that are actually for patients that help go through some of these steps. And if you need more education, you can watch them too. They're really helpful. And they certainly help me find better language to be able to have some of these conversations with my patients. The bottom line here, and hopefully we have really driven this fact home, is that MAT, medication for addiction treatment, saves lives. Addiction is a treatable, treatable medical disease, and we need to be using medications to help our patients the same way we do for other treatable medical diseases like diabetes or even now obesity, right? Um, high blood pressure, all that kind of stuff. It's the same idea. And so we want to make sure that patients who have alcohol use disorder, that we're giving them oral naltrexone. It's generic. It's so easy. Decreases number of drinks and decreases number of drinking days. We want to put patients who have opioid use disorder on methadone or buprenorphine. It decreases their mortality. It keeps them alive. It helps them to do things like live their life. And if they're on bup, they don't have to go to an OTP every single day for their methadone dosing, right? These are huge changes in our patients' lives that can add quality and happiness. Um, and if you need help in the moment, I really want to plug this line, the warm line. So if you're in California, you can always call poison control. That's one option. But this is a line that Hannah's buddies at UCSF that they run that you are welcome to call it is free. Um, they are not always readily available in that exact moment, but if you leave a voicemail, they will call you back. So it's an excellent option for our inpatient colleagues where you have a patient with you for a few days. If you need help talking about how do I microdose, how do I start on bup, how do I taper this methadone, how do I anything, give them a call and they're there for you uh, Monday through Friday. So you can leave them a voicemail and they'll get back to you. And then most of the things that we talked about today, if not all the things, are available to you at the California Bridge website. Feel free to go there. We have copies of all of our clinical protocols. They've been dropped in the chat if you're watching live, but they're here for you if you need them. And then if you want more, if you want to watch this again, if you want to see a dedicated lecture about alcohol use or just buprenorphine or methadone, we have all that available to you for free for CME uh, at the California Bridge Academy. So take a look there. These All of these units qualify towards the DEA eight-hour requirement that all of us have, doctors, NPs, and PAs. So please take a look there and feel free to uh, watch any of our stuff that you want to. And then finally, you can reach out to us at Bridge uh, to Treatment if you need us at all. And this is Dr. Snyder's contact info. And we have just a few minutes if there are any questions that we can take for you. Um, a lot of people have asked if you can have the slides. Yes, we will send a, a full recap out to everybody who was here. Uh, don't worry about that. And then we had a really great question about why divide the doses for buprenorphine initially. You don't have to do that. We mentioned this, that bup is a, can be a once a day dose. However, 
sometimes when patients are newer to buprenorphine, the rise and fall of the analgesic effects or the pain medicine effects are shorter as opposed to the long acting half-life for treating uh, withdrawal and cravings. So sometimes patients will actually feel more normal or they'll feel better if you take that same 24 hour dose and give it as two or three times a day dosing, just in that initial adjustment period. And then some patients will wanna eventually consolidate down to once a day, not all of them. Some people stay on twice a day for a long time. It's very patient driven based on how they feel, but it can be an easier transition off of illicit drugs sometimes if you separate out that dose. And can be really helpful in the setting of acute pain like we were talking about or people with chronic pain. So a lot of times for a hospitalized patient, we will do TID dosing. Yeah. And then okay. Okay, Hannah, somebody says, is it okay to cut the sublingual strips? The box yeah. does not do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So different pharmacies are different levels of strict on this. I will say in my outpatient practice, I routinely counsel my patients to cut their strips into halves or quarters. Um, uh, which is off label and you cannot guarantee that they are going to get exactly one milligram on each side. Right. Um, but we know that in most cases, the benefits of that outweigh the risks. I'll say that many hospitals have a policy where you can cut the tablets in half, but you can't cut the film strips in half. And you just kind of got to work with whatever your pharmacy is saying, because it's true that the box says not to do that. Again, we think probably clinically it's totally okay. Um, it's more a question of, is it going to be like 1.01 milligrams in one and like 0.99 milligrams in the other half? It's probably okay. Yeah. And then um, patients split a lot of their medications at home very successfully, but toprolol, whatever. And we don't freak out about it. So it's not a big deal. And then there was a question about naloxone distribution that you'll hear from people that it's not allowed for the ED versions to be distributed around the hospital. First of all, yes, it is. Um, the restrictions on naloxone distribution that did exist, most of them are gone. Now that naloxone is an over-the-counter drug. So it did actually change a lot of the concerns about those things. And this is a very specific set of guidelines that allow distribution programs to be able to give them like without patient labels, not from your Pixits or OmniCell. It's not an order in the computer, right? It's a really different process. And if you really wanted to get around that, Hannah made a great tip in there, which is um, if the ED has a distribution program and the hospital, the your particular hospital is not allowing the hospitalists to participate in that, then just have the ED nurse give it to the patient and put it with their belongings. That way they have it when they leave the hospital later too, right? That the naloxone can can become together with the patient at any moment in their existence in the hospital. It doesn't have to be at discharge. Okay, glancing through. Yes, and the navigator can deliver. I want to emphasize if you have a navigator, please. Um, if you are a navigator and you have not connected with your hospitalist team. Let this be the moment that urges you to do that. Reach out, find out who their, maybe their director or their chair is. See if you can connect with them and let them know that you are a resource um, because you're an amazing resource and not everybody uh, in the hospital knows who you are. I think that's where the majority of the clinical questions that we had in here. All right. We know this was a ton of information, a ton. So it will be available to you as a recording if you want to watch it again, if you want to share it with your, you know, teams back at home. If you need us, info at cabridge.org. If you missed Hannah's contact slide and you just really want to fangirl and talk to her, info at cabridge.org. We've got her info. We'll connect you. Anything that you need, please let us know. And at, we always say this, but we really mean it every time. Thank you for the time that you spent being here with us today. And thank you for everything that you're doing to help us try to save lives. Have a great week, everybody. Thank and thank you. you, thank you, thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Hannah's kid. Feel better. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>